Australia is a nation that is really big in size, but simultaneously has a smaller population for its size. The size of Australia is in between the size of Europe the continent and the European Union. Yet unlike Europe's population of 745 million people, Australia only has a little under 26 million people, 3% the population of Europe, despite being 75% of its size. This means in terms of administration, Australia does not have as many states as somewhere like the United States does with their 50 states. Australia has six states and two territories, with a giant desert in the middle. This has meant that despite all of these places being a part of Australia, they are all somewhat rivals of each other. They compete for their share of federal resources, they have their own local differences, and so they do not always get along with each other. But naturally, in a small group like this, there is always a sense from each state that one of them is treated the worst. In Australian politics, there is a term called being a Cinderella state. Just as how in the fairy tale of Cinderella, Cinderella was unfairly overworked, bullied, and mistreated by her stepmother compared to her stepsisters, each Australian state has at one point for some reason thought they were the Cinderella state. We have most of the mineral wealth, but we're neglected. We have lots of minerals and agriculture, but they always hate us. We don't get enough federal resources. We also don't get enough federal resources. We're a small island, so people forget we even exist. We have higher unemployment. Okay, so some of the reasons are a little sillier than others, but it's still something that Australian states have tried asserting many times. But of these states, Western Australia was the closest to go as far as almost leave Australia over its grievances. So we're going to get into some Aussie history, and just like my last video on Australian history, it'll be about a time it almost split apart. But before we get into that, we gotta talk about this video sponsor, Ridge. Ridge makes cool metal wallets with a sleek design, and they come in many designs you can choose from. All of your cards are now together instead of lost between a dozen pockets, and water won't ruin it like it can with a typical cheap leather wallet. If you use the code EMPEROR with the link below, you can get 10% off of your own Ridge purchase. So be sure to get a Ridge wallet today. Or if you don't want a wallet, you can also get one of their many other fine products too, like their awesome key case. You won't be disappointed either way. Thanks again to Ridge for sponsoring this video. So originally, the states of Australia were separate British colonies. They came together under a Federation of Australia in 1901 with the Constitution of Australia. But it certainly wasn't an easy decision. Each colony had different levels of prosperity and economic situations, so there was a worry on how they could voice themselves. There was also a weird situation where originally there were hopes for New Zealand and Fiji to join such a federation, but both vehemently rejected the idea. There were even political cartoons depicting Australians as criminal brutes that Fiji and New Zealand should stay as far away from as possible. While the idea of Fiji and New Zealand not joining a federation was accepted, pro-federation groups at least wanted the island of Australia to be unified above all else. However, of the mainland Australian colonies, Western Australia was the only one where right away their representatives expressed no interest in such a union. However, the Federation movement decided to draft a constitution anyway, and in 1899 there were referendums held in all the Australian colonies, except Western Australia, to support it. And since they were all British colonies, they sneakily asked the British Parliament to legislate the Federation of Australia into effect, in spite of Western Australia having not even approved of such of a thing. After all, they technically didn't need their permission, only the UK's. Eventually, Western Australia, worried about being left behind and facing pressure from pro-federation groups within the colony, agreed to hold a referendum on joining. In the year 1900, after there were assurances that states could have more powers to challenge federal authority, on July 31st, Western Australia approved federation by a solid 69.5% for to 30.5% against. However, the British Parliament already approved federation on July 5th, meaning that it didn't even matter. While Western Australia ended up supporting Federation quite solidly, the fact that they would have been a part of it even before being asked gives you an idea on why Western Australia would feel a little bit of resentment towards the rest of the country. Sure enough, not long after the Federation was made official in 1901, there would be calls for Western Australia secession. In 1907, James McCollum Smith began publishing articles in the Sunday Times in support of secession, and the movement began. However, it didn't really get very far for quite some time. 
Being a part of Australia gave Western Australia several economic advantages that most people benefit from, making it very hard to support such a thing. As long as they had the economic benefits, most people would want to stay. So then eventually the Great Depression happened and the economic benefit went away. West Australia's then main export of wheat had its prices plummet while unemployment reached nearly 30%. Taking advantage of the situation, a man named Keith Watson formed the Dominion League, a grassroots campaign group aimed at spreading support for Western Australia's secession. In theory, it would become its own separate nation and dominion within the British Empire, just like Newfoundland was in Canada at the time. As support rose, there was also the usage of the term Australia by those favoring secession, which I suppose sounds a little better than the Western Canadian secessionist term Wexit, but not by much. Also, remember how I said the UK approved Australian federalism before Western Australia even voted on it? Well, because of that, the Australian Constitution's first paragraph has a bit of an issue with it. Whereas the people of New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Queensland and Tasmania, humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God, have agreed to unite in one indissoluble federal commonwealth under the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and under the constitution hereby established. Yeah, Western Australia is left out. And a bit further down in Article 3, there is the following. It shall be lawful for the Queen, with the advice of the Privy Council, to declare by proclamation that on and after a day therein appointed, not being later than one year after the passing of this Act, the people of New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Queensland and Tasmania, and also, if Her Majesty is satisfied that the people of Western Australia have agreed thereto, of Western Australia, shall be united in a federal commonwealth under the name of the Commonwealth of Australia. So basically what that means is the Federation is totally legal, everyone has basically agreed to it. Oh, Western Australia? Well, I mean, Your Majesty, you could decide if they want it or not. That's entirely up to you. You don't need to ask them. This was not only used to stir up support for the idea that Western Australia was forced into the Federation, but some even speculated that it could be used as a loophole to give Western Australia exclusive pathways of leaving. To counter the Dominion League, anti-secessionists formed the Federal League of Western Australia. They argued that the correct route should be another constitutional convention, so that the state's grievances could be addressed and there could be legal changes to fix them. They also managed to get Australian Prime Minister Joseph Lyons and former Australian Prime Minister Billy Hughes to make speeches in favour of preserving the Commonwealth. But they were received rather poorly. Meanwhile, in local politics, the state was run by the Nationalist Party, ironically in support of secession despite the party's name. What made the situation even more ironic is that the Nationalist Party at the federal level in 1931 would merge with the Australian Party to form the United Australia Party, and the Western Australia chapter refused to play along and kept the Nationalist name. Meanwhile, the Labour Party was against secession for Western Australia. Eventually, the Nationalist Premier of Western Australia, Sir James Mitchell, held a referendum on Western Australian secession on April 8th of 1933, the same day as the statewide elections. To placate the anti-secessionists, there would also be a second question on the referendum asking for support for the second constitutional convention solution. Once the results came in, it turned out that 66% of Western Australians supported secession, an almost total flip from their support of federation 33 years before. The constitutional convention option was rejected by 57% of the voters. Voting in Western Australia was compulsory, so this was as solid of a victory as it was. However, in a bizarre twist, the Nationalist Party was voted out of office and replaced with a Labour majority government. But despite the Labour Party being against the secession of Western Australia, the new Premier Philip Collier accepted the results of the referendum and submitted the results to the British Parliament as they would need their approval for secession to be finalised. It seemed that Australia would officially be torn in two. But there was a confusing development thanks to the Statute of Westminster. In 1931, the British passed the Statute of Westminster to grant its dominions further self-rule, so they could do more things themselves without British approval. It wasn't full independence, but it did put into question whether British Parliament could approve of Western Australian secession. After 18 months of negotiations with a UK parliamentary committee on the matter, it was ruled that because of the Statute of Westminster, they could not accept the matter until the Australian federal government did. The Australian federal government naturally said no, so despite the referendum succeeding, the secession failed. 
This was in spite of the fact that Australia hadn't even fully adopted the Statute of Westminster yet, and wouldn't fully approve the entire document until 1942. So you could argue that this ruling was incorrect. Nevertheless, this failure basically stunted the movement. Prime Minister Joseph Lyons in 1933 established the Commonwealth Grants Commission to help address grievances and bring financial support to the states affected by the Great Depression. This resulted in the secessionist movement dying down, and aside from the occasional political rhetoric, never really had a serious chance of happening again. You tried secession I was there Parliaments collided, but they could never tear us apart. If you like this history video, be sure to like the video, and if you want to see more like it, you can support my channel with my Patreon. On my Patreon, you even get to see videos early, and you can vote on future projects. Every bit of support is appreciated. I'm Emperor Tiger Star, and I'll see you guys next time.